All right, I will start recording the class. Uh, again, behind me is the Digital Rocks Portal Offshore Miocene example. So I'm gonna advertise one each time. Um, let me share screen. So I have, uh, now that you're, uh, I have sent multiple messages. So there is one uh, about installing Bone J. I hope you didn't have trouble doing that. Did everybody manage to do so? If not, try kind of playing with it right now. <laughs> I also, uh, there is a lecture five uh, exercise on labeling. Uh, it's a single slide PowerPoint. If you can download it uh, right now from files. That'd be great. I don't think I sent a separate link, but it's uploaded. So that's going to be our exercise. But if you want to, if you want to download it right now, uh, that'd be great. So a brief review about uh, what what are we trying to do? We are trying to characterize our segmented images. So the whole idea of segmentation is to basically label my image and identify certain phases of interest, whatever my, there might be. My next step is now to do something with it. And uh, we often have to both manipulate segmented images, both like from the filtering point, there might be certain um, too small of a noise that needs to be cleaned up. And we have introduced some of the methods to do that. But sometimes we just actually need to go further and characterize. And it's this characterization that basically prompts us to define uh, what is digital topology? So topology in general is basically describing uh, connectivity in shapes of the uh, connectivity specifically of the objects. And uh, just like uh, in a rather ab abstract sense, so topology is actually a mathematical um, tool and it can be pretty abstract and it's famous for uh, basically making both donut and the coffee cup equal um, as far as topology goes and their connectivity. And we will go uh, to, to, to define why is that in a moment, uh, but basically what happens here is that you can continuously and differentiably morph one object into another. So there is um, uh, continuously differentiable functions that can actually map donut to a coffee cup and therefore from the topological standpoint they're the same so that level of abstraction it's kind of a little hard to think about but at the same time because it's it's uh, it's making things equal brain or is the same thing as a sphere and as long as it's this one piece without holes which is what topology seems to be interested in counting uh, that, Technically, it is from the mathematical standpoint, so we can, it's, it's a useful, somewhat abstract uh, characterization, but it's helpful in many different uh, domains at the same time. So, however, to, to be even start, we need to figure out how are things connected in the digital space, specifically because they're on this uh, grid that is kind of fixed. So one thing that we introduced uh, last time is the digital topology. I could have in 2D a pixel that has, if I look at all of its neighbors that it shares edge with, then those are my four neighbors, that's my four neighborhood. Um, and I could also include those that I share, share only corner with, in which case then I have eight of them and this is eight connectivity. This in 3D um, basically goes to six connectivity, those that I shared an entire side with, then uh, 18 connectivity if I count the side and an edge. Okay. Uh, so those are my red and blue. And here all I can do is uh, sort of a voxel, but what I can definitely do is I can take two boxes. I have two books, I have books. Uh, multiple transport books. So basically, and now I have to pop them into. So if my 
Oh, that's hilarious. My, my, they're not identified by this image algorithm that is apparently searching for people. So let me quickly uh, modify this in my, I need to go back to a regular background. All right. All right. So basically if I have books, these are, imagine these are my voxels, so they can share an entire side. They can share an edge, if I can line them up. And they can share just the corner, okay? So those are my three types of sharing. And now I can go back to my, I can actually change. So I'm gonna change now to quartz, just for, for kicks. All right, now let's remain the same. Quartz will be next time. Okay, so essentially those are my three types of um, connectivity. Um, which one is behind the connectivity? So you will, we will, you will often use software to analyze how many connected pieces of something do you have? Is your entire pore space connected? And software is not always transparent about that. So you have to be sensitive to that. And you will get ever so slightly different uh, different results. So that said, if the results are overall um, normalized by the volume content of something, then that should actually uh, work out. And statistically, you should still have a good description. So let's now actually do uh, the uh, one thing that we pointed out is that it depends how are you thinking of uh, connected pieces? How many you actually count? So here, this particular line, if I'm thinking about this line of being connected uh, uh, as eight con with eight connectivity, then essentially all of these pixels are connected. So it actually represents one object and it seems that that object is a line. However, if I, deem this phase, the blue phase, as four connected, then I actually have four separate objects. And likewise, this white pixels could be deemed connected or not connected depending on the type of connectivity you encounter them. There's also um, what is a point becomes problematic because if I have, for instance, uh, these two lines here, that are that are shown and they're intersecting at one pixel and that is great that should be a point however if i have lines that are at uh, inclined at each other their interconnections might actually end up being thick like these four pixels here so this in, what is an intersection and what is a digital point becomes somewhat problematic and these objects can often need to be thinned down and we're going to go through some uh, algorithms that are thinning basically you need to do erosion of this object without disconnecting the object okay? and those are so-called skeletonization algorithms Further, when you're digitizing any object uh, then depending on the cutoff value you choose for digitization you will get a slightly different um, slightly different object so basically you have if you if you look at the sphere here or the disk depending on whether you take into account these blue pixels or not you could have two different representations of what is essentially a sphere so these issues are always present there is no always, always a clear right or wrong answer is just that there is certain ambiguity at what a sphere is in this digital world and what connectivity is in the digital world so one has to be sensitive to those issues all right so now you will actually uh if you downloaded that powerpoint then please open it up and what i want you to do is to use these little objects and basically choose, try to label distinct blue grains. Let's say that the blue phase is my grains and you pick whatever little object. If you want to change the shape, you're very welcome to introduce new shapes. 
these yellow shapes, so label them. Uh, so different objects should have a different label. So try to figure out how many there are. And then I'm going to call on somebody to share their screen to show us how they labeled it and what they chose as connectivity. So go ahead and label. So basically you move these, the objects that you choose. So this is one object, for instance, okay? So you move these different labels. So I want different objects to have different little labels. Well, the file I have is a PDF and things are already labeled, so. <laughs> oh. The lecture five exercise labeling? Yeah, it's a PDF, not a problem. So I share the labeled result? That's hilarious. Okay. I mean, I did it by myself because of. <laughs> the PowerPoint is there. Uh, I have the, the PowerPoint, PowerPoint is there. Yeah, I'm not talking about the main file. There's a separate lecture five underscore exercise underscore labeling. Can you see that one? Yeah, but it's a new file. It's an it's a different file from the main. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's just a single single slide. Yeah, the one that is posted as PDF. Yes, it's already. It's actually partially labeled, I think. Okay, found it. Yeah, found it. All right. Yeah. So I'll just figure out how to let you share. If you click on share screen, then you can have to authorize all people to, to share there. Yeah, I think I did. Can you try sharing? Sure. It says that you actually disable it. I disabled, resume share, try now. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh boy, okay, this is what I'm trying to do is remote control, give mouse keyboard oh. control. No, not remote, not remote control. If you go at the bottom of your screen, what, it, what you have the, the oh now, now, now I have. Con so I gave you control, can you try sharing? Oh, sure, sure, sure. And just go back to the Zoom. Oh, you're controlling my screen. That's interesting. Yeah, that's that's what you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> without seeing it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. Okay, but uh, if you go back to your Zoom, so that you're not, since you're controlling my screen, can you go to stop share? Okay, go oh, to yeah. stop share. <laughs> wow. This Zoom has ideas. Did you actually also try? Uh, okay, I'm gonna stop share. And in where is now? It's, Multiple. It, okay, try now. Try sharing your. Okay, now I can. Okay. It's this little thing next to share screen that shows up only if I have it blown up. There we go. So now you're sharing. There we go. So you chose eight connectivity. Well, eight connectivity kind of encompasses four connected. And I yeah. guess what you're pointing, pointing out is that these, what are these types of objects? Like these uh, four point stars are four point stars versus five point stars. So four point stars are both four connected and eight connected. 
this one big object um, uh, is uh, which is five point stars is eight connected and the difference would be let's see did anybody use four connectivity can you share your screen if you did four connectivity yeah i did all right go ahead Right. then you will get this oh hi <laughs> kitty kitty all right <laughs> there is there's this one additional object that you get if you assume that things are four connected in which case this connection through the corner does not exist okay so, the, uh, so this is with full connectivity so i yes. have three different objects so yes this is the first one yes. then this second one and the third one and if yes. i go with eight connectivity then we have two separate objects correct but you will also see that well sometimes if this connection is faint this large object could split in two each half the size in this case you really shaved off one small piece right so it's not a huge difference actually if you normalize this by volume this is almost like a little noisy end but it could happen that if you have a barely like two large objects barely connected through a point like this that you're going to instead of one large get two halves and both those halves so you will have quite a change in the volume that both occupy but that's simply because of the resolution it's essentially a resolution issue if this was a thin neck of some sort uh, it, it's very easy for it to get digitally disconnected and to an extent, not you cannot do much about it. It's a finite resolution issue that happens, and you just have to be sensitive. So, technically, uh, have a little bit of space there in terms of interpreting these statistically as a statistical representation rather than something that is absolute and that everybody has to get precisely the same answer. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about this? I'm going to go back to me sharing the screen. All right. Do you see my screen now? Yeah. yeah. All right. So let me continue the presentation. So here for, well, I had a semi-labeled, <laughs> a semi-labeled <laughs> uh, image uh, where this one star is either in or out, depending on the type of connectivity that is assumed. There is a, behind this is a algorithm that is finding both connected components, but it can also label distances, which is very useful. Or sort of, if you think about the erosion and dilation we did, it can do sort of like as you're eroding, you're eroding the most, the furthermost labels, and then you're going in. So basically, you can also look at that as some sort of distance labeling. So technical algorithm that is behind this if you wanted to uh, if you wanted to do uh, uh, do this on any image is called multiple names grass fire algorithm is pretty common um, because it kind of spreads like a grass fire from a front so what basically happens let's say that all of these yellow pixels were lab were zero in my image and you want to count them or uh, or label them so first you're going to do is you're going to find first one that is labeled zero so first yellow pixel and you're going to label it one then you're going to go through all of its neighbors and neighbors depend on the type of connectivity that you choose so let's say that we choose uh, eight connectivity so all of its neighbors are these two you add them to the list so there should be a list structure associated with it and the one that you're done with, you actually kind of label as done, possibly in a separate image, or give it like, okay, I'm done with it. I don't need to consider it again. Then you go on the next one on the list, that would be this one, and add all of its labors, uh, neighbors to the list that haven't been added or added already. So this one has been added. So you now add this one to the list and label this one as done. And then you keep going and you do that until you can, until you actually have um, neighbors that are eight connected. So at some point you're going to run out of those neighbors. And at that point, all of these are labeled one and done. Okay. 
then you increase your label to two and you move on to the next available phase zero voxel or whatever it is that you're counting whatever phase you're counting so that would be this one and you give it a label two and then add its two neighbors in this case two neighbors eight connected neighbors to the list and then you try to add more neighbors there's no more neighbors you're done you're done so you just go and process all of these as done and then that's basically your labels one and your labels two and that's an essentially an algorithm and you repeat until you're done with all of the voxels that you want to incorporate so again that is you could basically look at that if you also pay attention to what is the stage to the pixels as you're adding them so this is stage one then stage two then third layer of labors fourth layer of labors this is sort of a distance labeling or a very fast way to label distances from uh for in the same type of algorithm okay so you can do either distance labeling or just labeling components all right the first paper that is describing the version of this algorithm to my knowledge is a uh, one year older than me um 1976 it's uh, named percolation and cluster distribution and uh, labeling techniques uh, for the papers it's in philosophical review if you're interested it's fundamental to many applications basically any kind of image analysis no matter what it is that you're trying to count so different areas just kind of call these disconnected components differently for us it could be different grains or different uh, fluid uh, fluid blobs or whatever it is that we recognize in the image but everybody is trying to count something right so let's actually do that so we're gonna grab that beads dry segmented raw image that was 100 cube okay and let's play with it the key question i want to find out is the following it appears to me that the pore space the white space is connected from one side to the other but i don't know that for a fact and the tighter the space is harder it is to know second thing that i want to know is how many of these little disconnected things do i have inside the spheres okay? because i might want to remove them so let's find that out there is a 3d connected components labeling in fiji so let's open up fiji so work with me so i'm going to import raw and it should be in your segmented data beads we had a hundred cube i think this was it yeah that's the one so beads dry segmented eight bit 100 by 100 by 100 so we worked with it last time already so that's the one that we were trying to do clean up um so let's just open it up okay and i'm gonna do plus to enlarge it So these are my, so this is view in 2D, it's slice view, it's hard to sometimes tell. Now here it's kind of obvious that it's connected, there's quite a bit of pore space. Um, behind me in the image, epoxy tells you whether something is connected because epoxy is entering only through the connected pieces so that you might find that parts of the pore space that are not connected um, but if I don't have an experimental measurement then what do I do I need to do that digitally right so if you go to you can also search for find connected components it's in that plugins process menu that is large and if you open it up you will see menu allow diagonal connections so diagonal connections i think it means 26 connectivity haven't properly tested it i need to do that but it could be 18 
it's not clear. It's not very clear because diagonal could be across an edge or it could be across a corner. I'm interpreting across just a vertex or a corner, but that's um, something to be tested. You do not want to display image for each region because in porous media, that's going to quickly uh, shut down your computer because the algorithm does not guard itself memory-wise. So it's going to keep opening different copies of the file for each region it finds. And if there is thousand of them, that means thousand of files. So you end up needing to reboot your computer. So thread lightly. Do that only when you know something already. Never do it on a, a by default. So you want to display one image for all regions. It's going to color them differently. And you want to display a results table. You can start for a, from a point, which is actually very useful. If you want to find out whether you're connected from here to the other end, then you just give it a point to start the process from. So it's going to just use that as a starting point in the same grass fire al uh, algorithm that I mentioned. And finally, what you want to do is, so, so I want here, as I move around, let me move this away a little and move this away. So as I move around, um, this is 255 and this is, uh, this is zero. So you want image, you want to look at the regions for values over 100 works because that's going to be my 255. But I can type in 254 if I wanted to. In this case, I have only two values, so it's all good. And minimum number of points in a region is one. That means that we're going to account for all of them. And you can also stop after you find first or second or third region. That's a now up to you if you know what you're doing. Now, let's give it a try. I'm just going to say OK and let it do. All right. So you will now see a colored image. Red is my first region. So that's majority of my pore space. And I can see since this portion here is red, it's actually connected in 3D to the pore space. And that's something that is good to know. But as you go further, you will find this little green one or a little yellow one. Those are the disconnected ones. And some blue ones. And it's just going to go through colors. And sometimes you won't be able to visually distinguish as many colors. How many colors can a person distinguish properly? Um, I, I don't know that for a fact, but certainly not as many as the number of blobs you could have. And here you see a results table where the largest region is 342217. And then there's a whole bunch of small ones, disconnected ones. And they don't add up to much in terms of porosity. So what is the porosity of the uh, connected porosity? Quiz time. This is a hundred cube. Anyone? Thirty-four percent. Yeah, point like three four two two one seven, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's number of these divided by hundred cube, which is an easy division to make. Okay, so that's why we can see that these are all obviously these are small ones, and this is what I was saying that technically you can disregard them you're not doing much volumetrically to your image okay. now now if i wanted to do a simulation from this and this is why i'm actually spending so much time the important part is that you if you do fluid simulation you're typically imposing some sort of a pressure gradient or something that is simulating a pressure gradient you don't want to impose a pressure gradient across something that is not connected and cannot release that pressure to the ends. So it's actually rather important to remove disconnected pieces 
before you actually do a fluid simulation. And it's important to clean up step that is often forgotten. And sometimes it influences the simulation, sometimes it doesn't. So be mindful, ask yourself, do I need to clean certain things up? Or if, and if you actually get the simulation to blow up on you, you might want to go back and clean it up. So here is, if I wanted to do simulation from here, I would actually now knowing that my largest connected component, which is the one that I'm interested in, if I'm interested in simulating for permeability, this is like 34% of the volume. Okay. I can then now go, I don't want to save these measurements. Thank you very much. I can go and repeat this process. I'll find connected regions. And now I will say display image for each region. But here I will say that my minimum points in the region should be something that is larger than, I'm gonna do 300,000 because I know that I'm for sure going to get that largest point. But that's after I've already did an initial um, scoping <laughs> of what the uh, size of the largest region is. And when I say, okay, then you're going to get only one region. The rest will simply be ignored. And there's this separate image. And it's this image that is your sort of cleaned up image where all of the small ones were essentially converted to the other phase. And this is the one that I would use in simulation. You could also do an open and close uh, open and close or, or erode and dilate exercise to get rid of some of these small um, edges, but that's smoothing the edges now. At least everything is connected. Questions? Okay. So we have worked through some of these. So basically, suggested practice for this cleaning up the segmentation for the purpose of simulation is do the close operation to remove certain surface imper imperfection and those very small uh, uh, pieces of volume. You can remove small components simply by looking, uh, finding the number of disconnected components, looking where your largest one is, what its size is, and then you basically. Uh, save only the largest component for simulation. In general, I do like cleaning up this smallest disconnected components simply for them um, to remove the noise. But you have to be make, your, make certain that you're not affecting a large proportion of the image. All right, so second thing that we're gonna do is distance labeling. And this is a whole lot of fun because, well, I, I'm geeking out because I find these very pretty. But um, essentially, uh, let's, let's try it on a 2D, but this can be done in 3D as well. Um, so there is, if you open data beads, the, the, the dry slide, slice that we worked with, it's a single image. And it should be in your recent. This one? No, that's the demographic one. I want the segmented one. These are operations on segmented images. Binary. This will work. Any of these slices will work. Everybody got that? Yes. So now let me just show in PowerPoint what we're going for. And then we can practice it. So this is your original phase. And there is, you can use 3D or 2D distance labeling uh, transform. And essentially you pick what I want to find out. So there's a distance map uh, that works, it can work only in one phase. So in this case, I'm doing it only in the pore space. And you get this very light color 
where you're far away from the nearest grain. So here, when I'm deep in the pore space, I'm, my distance to the closest grain is pretty large compared to being right next to the grain where it's really small. So you can do distance labeling. And in this case, it's actually Euclidean distance. It's actually a real number. What I pointed out as an algorithm earlier was sort of a, just a counting. Uh, so it was an integer, but there is actually a pretty fast algorithm uh, that does this Euclidean distance transform uh, that is real numbers. So you will, really what it is, is this distance to the closest grain. It's also the value of the radius of the largest sphere you can actually uh, embed into the pore space and remain in the pore space. So that largest sphere you can embed is touching the grain somewhere or the first grain, maybe it's touching multiple grains. And in those cases, you get the value of that radius. So it's basically those radii or distances that you're actually seeing a representation of in this image. Okay? And you can also do sine distance. So you can do positive values in the pore space, negative values in the grain space, then you get something like this. So as I'm moving in here into this grain, you will see the distances go. So you can play either way. And of course, whether it's positive or negative in the grain space or pore space, it's really up to you, okay? And you can invert the image to get those values. All right, so let's try this plugin. And you need segmented images image for this. Now I'm, this is, There is Euclidean distance transform. Let's try the sign one. Okay. So this works on 2D and 3D, this plugin. So if I had 3D image, I would just look at the slice of something that is three dimensional. So that's important to think, but this is easier to look at. And as I'm moving around, So you will see values here, right? So here values 255 and zero. Here the value is 14, positive 15 or so. It's positive in the middle of the pore space and negative 31 in the middle of the grain space. If I just do just Euclidean transform, Oh, whoops, I need to click something properly. Okay. Then I'm just working in the pore space and my green space remains zero. So it's working with the 255 phase, this algorithm is. If you want to flip it and work only with the green space, uh, then you need to invert this image before you do that. Did everybody get a chance to try? So question, and you can either chat or, or, or just respond. So if I, how could I use this for characterization? Let's say that I have two different images of two different rocks. Does this appear to be a useful type of characterization of images? What could I plot as statistically? It's nice to look at them. This is surely pretty. And this is going to be my next background. But what else could I do? Anyone?
what does histogram give me? So basically zero, I can ignore, those are my greens. And this is distribution of these numbers. If I, I can of course pick, maybe I should have picked bench size that is a little smaller because I have about, maximum is about 15. And let's do 20 bins, plenty. Let's try now. Okay. I could try to exclude zeros, and then after that, I can look at this distribution of numbers. And if I mo multiply it by the physical value of the pixel length or voxel length, which in this case, this is a model medium, so it doesn't matter, but I could convert it to a physical value. I could compare different media this way to see how tight they are, because the more of the smaller values I have, comparatively speaking, the tighter the medium. So it's one way to characterize. It's not precisely pore size, but it's correlated with it. Okay. Does that make sense? I hope so. Wave at me or do some sort of reaction. <laughs> what would happen if like the segmented image has more than two phases? Like how would it? recognize the distances between them. You would basically work with one of the phases. I I think this algorithm wants you to work with 255 and zero. So you would basically look at the phase you're interested in. And so, so mm -hmm. convert all of the phases you're interested in looking at into a value 255, and that's what you'd give to the algorithm. All right, so I'll fix that and the thresholding before I actually apply these. So let's actually do that quick test. You can actually do, I think you can divide this image calculator, just divide the entire image. Um, just divide or divide by 255. Mm, no. Ah, uh, no, I cannot do point wise because there is math. Image math. Let me just remind myself it's uh, math. Divide. I can divide all of the pixels by value 255. Okay. Now the preview. And the reason why it looks uh, looks dark because now uh, all of them are zeros and ones and that's technically black, right? So I need to adjust, but I have zeros and ones, right? You see that? Yeah. All right, so let's try to expose this to the algorithm and see whether it's gonna work. Process, Euclidean distance. Huh, it's still picked. So it ignored zero and it picked values one and worked with it. That's interesting. So the algorithm actually picked the zeros, uh, non-zero values. That's what it seems to me. But that's another further test would be if I had multiple phases, could I actually run this algorithm and would it just pull all of the non-zero ones into one? The safest is to have the phase that you want to work with identified as the That's the, those little details of the how is it implemented, right? And hopefully if you go online, um, there's actually those details are written, but sometimes they're not. So that's that was the uh, that's why I tested it quickly. All right, now this is our labeling exercise. Okay. So again, this can be a useful characterization and we're gonna uh, 
mention it uh, further. If you actually kind of look at this image, uh, you can see that these uh, largest values sort of trace a skeleton of the pore space, which is very useful. Whoops. Um, because technically, these largest values, if you look at them on the sign distance map, they trace sort of how is the pore space connected in terms of a simple graph. And that can be uh, used for both visualization. Uh, it could be also used, so that's called skeletonization, and that's often medial axis, the center line. You just have to be careful not to disconnect it just because, so all of these are maxima, local maxima. So they have to be kind of thinned down without disconnecting them, which is where topology exercise is useful. And basically you can look at this as a skeleton of the pore space. Now, uh, it's easier to look at things and you can, it's easier to analyze connectivity because it's a simple representation of the pore space. It's much smaller in the footprint. And it could be used for various network, network algorithms as well. All right, so quick quiz. Donut and coffee cup, do they have same geometry or topology? Topology. Topology. So geometry actually is this shape of the surface that is different. And that's what we tend to focus on in math since early stages. Uh, you like to, first thing you're asked is to pick a circle from a square, right? Like when you're a child in <laughs> primary school. Uh, so that is geometry. And the uh, donut and coffee cup do have different geometry. However, they have the same topology. So there's this continuous transformation from one to another. Now, how it's quantified can be actually a little hairy. Uh, and we're just gonna, we're just gonna kind of put the main points on it. Um, technically, what you go and uh, topologically count is the number of connected components. That's an easy one. That We just did that exercise. Then number of handles and cavities or isolated voids. So if I had a hollow sphere, I have a cavity within that I can't reach. That's a cavity or isolated void. However, if I have a something like this donut or literally on my mug i do have a mug here it's just not properly recognized by the segmentation algorithm of this zoom right here's a mug um basically those are handles so i can basically from the outside uh go through an object and uh and turn a handle the way it's described mathematically is something like we call bounding cycles so if i look at the c here I can shrink this circle C to a point without, by staying in the object. So I can shrink it with a point. However, the circle B, I cannot shrink to a point without exiting the object if this donut is actually empty. And a uh, similar is true for A. So that's something uh, that we can use to mathematically describe these uh, non-bounding cycles. Um, and there's another abstract point called betting numbers. It's just abstracted because it can apply to very different objects. Betting number zero is the number of connected components. Betting number one is the number of handles or genus. And betting number two is number of cavities. And these are pretty, they can get pretty complex. So let's see, let's see a little quiz. If I have a solid sphere, how many connected components do I have? How many handles? How many cavities? You write that down on a piece of paper. And then we're gonna show that. And the same question for the hollow sphere. And then the same question for two solid spheres. and then a solid torus. So try these first four. So 
So I'm going to pick on somebody I haven't heard from today. Ying, are you there? Oh, yes. So how many connected components do I have for a solid sphere? Uh, just one. Just one. How many handles? A zero. Zero. And cavities? I think there's no cavities. No zero. And Bernie, when I change that to a hollow sphere, what changes? Number of uh, connected components, handles, or cavities? Would it be the cavities or the? Yeah, the cavity. Yeah. Right. And then two solid spheres. Again, they're solid, so I have no handles or cavities, but I have two connected components. Right. And then once I have this coffee mug, I have a handle, right, or a solid one. And so off you go. And some of these, you can play with these things. Like some of these actually kind of get uh, hairy. And I'm, I'm still not, this cubic frame still confuses me. How do I get <laughs> to, to five uh, handles and uh, not six? <laughs> so anyway. So this can be a little bit of... Uh, difficult to work out. So it's actually a pretty good idea to have some software help. Um, connected components are the same. Again, the my brain image and as long, uh, as, long as you don't have some uh, serious segmentation issues, you shouldn't have a hole in the brain. Um, well, if you do get a hole in the brain after processing brain image, that might be because of a tumor inside the brain. And that's something that should tell you uh, that there is a problem. But if all is well and it's a healthy brain and it's a good image of a brain, then technically um, the topology of a brain is the same as that of a sphere. You shouldn't have cavities or handles or anything like that. So in that sense, character it's, it's a good concept for characterization. Good news is that there is, um, there's a way to compute this and it's actually proven to be um, a way to characterize porous media as well, in particular fluid uh, components. So these Betty numbers, zero, one, and two, are kind of a little nasty to calculate directly, especially on something that is as complex as a porous medium. However, they're actually algorithmically easy to do using digital connectivity, that's the only connectivity concepts, and mapping the entire image as a graph. And technically, locally, uh, you, can, you can translate whatever you do in a local neighborhood to a large image and characterize them. So th there's something called Euler uh, characteristics, which is from the um, study of planar graphs. And you can define it, this characteristic is number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces. So those are vertices are zero dimensional elements, edges are one dimensional elements and faces are two dimensional ele elements. So if you just take any graph, um, you can just put something on a plane, you can figure out um, if it's just a square that has um, all of the edges, you can actually figure out what Euler characteristic is for that. And as you add a three dimensional medium, you can basically uh, put that that on a grid. It's basically a graph, and you be, you can actually analyze Euler characteristic uh, of it. Okay, so we there was actually a paper where I'm going to use it. Uh, use this image because it's easier to look at. There was a paper in 2013 that looked at the topology of the non-wetting phase trapping. This was CO2 trapping in different types of media. So if you have a sandstone, these are trapped blobs within a sandstone. If you have sintered glass beads, uh, within sintered glass beads, loose, loosely packed glass beads and crushed tuff. Tuff is volcanic material. Then basically there was this, um, there was this, you can see the saturation of this non-wetting phase that was 6%, 11%, 9%, and 29% in all of these different materials. So that's one thing to look at. And you can also look at the 
uh, Euler characteristics in terms of these cavities and handles and what uh, within them. And not all blobs are the same. If they're all topologically like a sphere, like this, this blob is topologically a sphere, but this one is not because it actually has a handle. Okay. So that will change the Euler characteristic. So the more complex these, um, these blobs are, the Euler characteristic and their topology changes. Um, and I can use, uh, look at the integrated value of these um, Euler characteristics of all of these individual blobs to characterize the type of the blobs that is seen. Um, so the, you can see the sandstone in this particular, and it can be affected both by uh, the type of the medium, so that's the medium geometry, but also what were the capillary numbers and flow rates used. Uh, so the connectivity of the residual phase will change in those cases. So that's something that can uh, characterize an experiment. And there's also, this is just a graph of how the Euler number which is this Euler characteristic uh, of the initial phase versus as you basically, um, as you disconnect more and more of these non wetting blobs, then the number of disconnected components, which is effectively these vertices, but this number of disconnected components, beta zero gets very large. So if you have a large number of blobs, this will start dominating and you can see how you move from uh, this Euler number that is much smaller or even negative into a large positive number um, during the process of imbibition. Okay. All right. So we need a bone J plugin for this. And we have about 10 minutes left, so we can um, do the uh, exercise on a sphere. So one thing that I'd like to, uh, just the very basic thing, what we know is a sphere, one single sphere, and there is an image of a sphere available for you in your topology, topology exercise. So it's a segmented sphere. And basically you can, there's this particle analyzer that will give you everything that you choose to set up. So let's do that. Open, import raw. Oh. I'm in the wrong folder. Topology. It's 100 by 100 by 92, by the way. Yeah. So there's a particle analyzer, and it's somewhere on this big list. Bone J should show up as a so you could do moments of inertia they should all be equal for a sphere that's one good test 
thickness, fitting in ellipsoid surface area and close volume Euler characteristic. I'm going to try all of these. Since it's just one particle. Whoa. I might have issues with Java. Maybe. No, it's all good. So you got the surface of the sphere. You can see the major, the axis of rotation, which is just the simple 3D. Where are my measurements? So measurements that you asked for should show up as a table of results. Centroid value, that's basically center of this algorithm. So volume, surface area. I1, I2, I3 are the moments of inertia, which for a sphere, they should be equal. If you get an elongated object, you're going to have one major one, large one, and that's essentially the diameter uh, or one it scales with the diameter and the other two would be much smaller if it's an elongated object and so forth and where's my did I, I did ask for Euler number there we go Euler number is one number of holes zero and cavities so then from these three numbers, you can figure out what the number of con connected components is, which is one. Major radius, intermediate radius, minor radius, so they're all close to 40. Everybody got this? I think not. Sometimes this software works what I call sinusoidally. Sometimes Java version doesn't work well with Fiji, and then that fixes itself on the next installment. So did you get anything? No, it seems that I'm I'm missing some three D libraries. That I need to install as in addition to the bond. Mm -hmm. Didn't so. figure out dependencies. That's interesting. Did you restart your image J after installing bond J? I did. Sometimes, especially so 3D viewing and surface visualization is something that is intense. And the uh, image J is not the best surface visualizer out there in terms of how fast it works. So sometimes you, if you have one object like this, then it's simple. However, if you have multiple objects, you might not want to uh, do all of the options. So if you just do numerical options, skip 3D, any kind of 3D viewing. So here I opted for this visualization and it's kind of pretty to see it than if you have multiple things, but sometimes you're just into, you do that on a smaller image, uh, but on anything larger, I wouldn't do it. Oops, I should have. Um, I can just show you on the plugins, Bon J. On all of the options, analyze, particle analyzer. So skip graphical results. So you might want to skip graphical results and just go and because these are just computations. For some reason, I, I think I have a different version of Bond J because I don't have that same as, as you. When you get the Analyze Skeleton, I have an option called Analyze Skeleton, but mm -hmm. I don't have any other options there. 
So I basically installed this at the beginning of semester. Whoa. <laughs> and I inadvertently ran this on that <laughs> image of a... It fit an ellipsoid. I'm not sure to what it is. It probably fit the ellipsoid to a pore space. Look at that. <laughs> okay. The results can be interesting when the object is complex. So this ellipsoid is either fitting to the entire pore space or to entire grain space, one or the other. Either way, it's hard to interpret because it's not an object that has an obvious interpret uh, orientation. So try to compute this for things that actually make sense to compute for. Okay, plugins. Um, I installed this basically at the beginning of the semester uh, because this computer is from the beginning of the semester. So you're not having all of these? I have, don't... I have, I have them, but some of them I have like different, different options actually like. Huh. Um, for example, I have instead of analyze, I have analyze skeleton. That's this one. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm missing. I have some, but I don't have like any other menu displaying. Can you from search the... for particle analyzer? Let me just do that and use British English. Particle analyze S with an S. I, I found it. So bone J is actually, it was analysis of bone images mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot of bones that are porous, well, porous. And study of their porosity and how connected the pore space is, is similar to what we would do for uh, porous media. So there's a lot of results that can translate. I try to do that one, but it's, I get the same uh, hmm. error about the the three D Java libraries. So, so I think that's probably that what. So even these errors, because these showed up as errors, but in the end, it actually worked. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, it, it's not even an error. It's just like a, a message that. Um, yeah, it's just a message. Yeah, but it, this can result in an error, and I've had, as I said, like sinusoidal. There was a semester where I couldn't, some of the 3D things I couldn't teach at all. Um, not using my computer anyway. I actually think the problem is the computer because this is one of, this machine is a PG machine. So it has like okay. a lot of So it has maybe stuff. an older version? I guess. That might be it. Did everybody else have issues? Say if you have, otherwise I'm going to assume you're okay. Yeah, mine was fine. Um, Javier, maybe, oh, sorry, maybe try updating. Um, like you have to add bone Self -update, Yeah. Yeah, like when you go to the advanced options, you have to and, and like you manage websites. You should be able to do that even if you're not admin. No, I, I I did that. I did that. I I followed the whole the whole thing <laughs> on the Bonje website. But I actually didn't have to download it as well. It was already there. So uh, at the beginning, I don't know if you followed, but the very beginning, when I was introducing how do you do the updater. I clicked on it in class and say, well, click on this if you pay attention right now, we'll need it later. <laughs> so another one that we will need uh, that can be useful, but that's another one that is, it's this 3D menu. Uh, I don't know, can you all check whether you have it? Yeah, I do. In plugins, yeah. Um, that one is useful because it actually has a 3D watershed version. That's our next topic. So I'm gonna, uh, so it has watershed and Voronoi diagrams. They do exist in distance maps and all that. They do exist in 2D easily. This is a slightly different uh, 
uh, implementation of distance map, but 3D watershed is something that doesn't exist in PG other than this 3D, it's 3D suite or something like that. So if you don't, let me know and I'll send you how to update it. Does everybody have this 3D? Yeah, I have. Okay, good. Yeah. We don't know whether it works yet, but you can <laughs> try watershed on one of these on this image and see whether it works. But uh, we will use it next time. Okay. All right. Well, I see you on Monday. How are write ups coming along? I'm going to take that that means they're coming along well. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a lovely this self interpretation if I don't hear anything. <laughs> I assume everything is well. Okay. Well, Bernie and Javier and I are going to meet again on Friday to okay. see like what to do next. Yeah. Okay, now I have to figure out where is my recording. The menu differs depending how I open it more. Stop recording. Here we go. Okay. See you all on Monday. Okay. See you. Thank, Thank you. you.